2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now? so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Thanks, Katie. Hopefully you've got a handout on your chair. Um, would you start by forgiving me for completely changing my outfit? I, um, I take it as a great sign that I have totally acclimatised to Glasgow because I only packed thermals and wool jumpers and it turns that down here in the south, uh, it's really mild. So genuinely thought I didn't have enough clothes with me, but um, yeah, we're fine. Um, books on 1 and 2 Thessalonians, just if you're sort of feeling inspired, and you're like, yeah, let's have a crack at this. Um, uh, John Stott in the BST series on 1 and 2 Thessalonians, I found quite helpful. It's a little bit in the camp of like three different chapters, but actually getting into the detail, super clear, super helpful. Um, so um, that was good. And then Greg Beale in the, what was this, IVP New Testament commentary series. This, what's this crazy cover? Um, yeah, a bit more, like a bit more technical. Sometimes he takes a while to say things, but like he's also says some like quite bold things. We're like, mm, yeah, Greg. Um, and um, super helpful, just thorough, he's thorough. So those were, if you want to, to get into, um, those would be helpful. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I wonder what your emoji would be as that was being read. I think mine is like that wide-eyed like, oh, one. Um, and my aim is to like um, convince us that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 should have that one with the hands that's like happy. Um, so that's where, we're, that's where we're heading vibe-wise. Um, the world is obsessed with its own ending. It just doesn't know how it's going to happen. 
Um, if you type the word apocalypse into a movie website, you will discover that the end is going to come at the hands of either zombies, aliens, apes, Thanos, it's a Marvel reference, <laughs> a weather event, a climate catastrophe, a pandemic, nuclear Armageddon, or someone travels through time and like upsets the space-time continuum and, and that's it, to name but a few. Um, outside of the world of movies and in the world of science, does anyone know what, what happened yesterday on the 23rd of January? What's on the news? Um, the doomsday clock was reset. Did someone say that? Yeah, the doomsday clock was reset. Um, so there's a bunch of big brains, the scientists, um, and they say the doomsday clock is a design that warns the public about how close we are to destroying our world with dangerous technologies of our own making. It's a metaphor, a reminder of the perils we must address if we're to survive on the planet. And last year, they set the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. They were like, this is an unprecedented level of threat to the world, um, according to the scientists. And yesterday, they reset it to 90 seconds to midnight. Um, obviously, didn't have the, weren't, they weren't quite bold enough to move it closer to midnight. But um, they think the end is pretty near. Um, how's it going to end? How's it all going to end? Let's see if chapter two of two Thessalonians helps us. Why don't I pray again um, as we get into it? Um, our Heavenly Father, your word is a light to our feet and in it you reveal um, yourself to us. We praise you so much um, that this chapter is in the Bible and you have something to say to us. And we pray that we would have ears to hear um, and humble hearts ready to listen. Um, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the big um, question of chapter two. How do I know the world hasn't, um, uh, the end of the world hasn't happened? And how should I feel about it? How do I know the end of the world hasn't happened? And how should I feel about it? I don't know if you've ever had your own end of the world panic. Um, I, I did when I um, was about eight years old and we had a family trip into London, big day, and we went to the planetarium. I don't think it's there anymore. It's, it used to be where Madame Two Swords is. And um, we went and it's, you know, the planet, have you ever been to a planetarium? It's like a big circle and you like line the chairs and lie back. And then the lights go out and there's this big presentation about the universe and stars and our solar system. And um, the thing that was news to me as an eight year old is that uh, the sun is a star. You all know this. The sun is a star, stars have a shelf life. When they get to the end of their shelf life, they die. Um, but stars don't like retire quietly. No, no, they run out of hydrogen and they like explode into a red giant and our sun is gonna explode into a red giant and consume the earth and we would all die in like 10 million degree heat, frazzled to a crisp. And I was like, um, very concerned. I had a lot of questions like, when is this going to happen? Will I know it's coming? Am I going to see the sun coming to like, that was my big one. Am I going to see it coming and know I'm going to die? Hideous. Um, should I be watching for signs? All these kind of things. Like it kept me up at night and then, um, you know, it's quite scary. Um, and I think a lot of people read two Thessalonians and react to chapter two a bit like the way I reacted to the planetarium. Um, it causes a lot of worry and a lot of like hand wringing and like, oh, what are all these things? And I think that's really understandable. The language in chapter two is kind of wild. And what did you think as it was read? It's just not the way we're used to talking, is it? Just the word lawlessness. Oh, it just sounds out of control, doesn't it? Like it's some kind of spiritual wild west, like pew pew, like we've got a mysterious figure, Satan's at work, people are falling to a delusion. It, it sounds scary, sounds awful. It's very easy for this chapter to sound like that and um, to be kind of taught like that. So how do we approach it? How do we tackle a chapter like this? Um, we did, so we did two Thessalonians in our women's Bible study. Um, side note, this is a side note. Here's how we did it, four weeks. The first week, we did the whole thing in a one -er. 
Um, so we read the whole thing, I printed it out, we did our like just noticing stuff, um, we just talked about the big themes, and then we talked about what we thought God was going to be doing in us as we studied it for the next three. Um, and then we took a chapter at a time and um, uh, again just did lots of observing, um, lots of thinking about what was encouraging. Um, um, but when we got to chapter two, um, we, we did a little bit of work of thinking about what's going to just help keep us on the straight and narrow in this chapter. And so normally I like to kind of untangle the ball of wool, just be led by the group or whatever. I was like, no, we're just going to just get a few things in place here because there were, I was just worried about a few things. Um, so how do, we, how do we approach a chapter like this? Here's a really simple lesson when we're studying the scriptures, and that is look for the application that is given in the passage. Look for the application that is given in the passage. And in chapter two, Paul just tells us straight up what he's hoping for the Thessalonians. We don't have to guess. And so he starts with a concern about them feeling distressed by the teaching they might have heard. Have a look at verse two, and um, we're just sort of starting at the end of verse one in chapter two. It says, we ask you brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed by some teaching that they've heard. So number one, don't be shaken or alarmed. That's a big application. The Thessalonians, they've heard something that's unsettled them. My mum would also use the word wobble um, about their faith. They've had a bit of a wobble. And so I take it that what Paul is going to teach them in this chapter is going to be like a corrective. It's going to have the opposite effect. Um, he goes on to say he doesn't want them to be misled. So have a look at verse three. Let no one deceive you in any way. Paul wants to bring them clarity and certainty about what they've been taught. And at the end of the chapter, he has another big, clear, stated application. He wants them to be solid as a rock, to have the Christian equivalent of nerves of steel. So have a look at verse 15 in chapter 2. It says, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast. Or hold to the traditions. It's kind of a Pilates move from Paul. Feet firm, pull the tummy button back, standing firm in their faith. So here are two really important safeguards um, that help us as we tackle whatever mayhem we think is in the middle. Whatever answers we come up with for, for who's who and what's going on, if it leaves us feeling unsettled and scared about the future, or if it makes us anxious and wobbly in our faith, um, we've missed the mark, okay? We're not lining up with Paul's pastoral desires for these Christians, okay? Lots of nods, we can see that kind of bracket around the passage. So it's like having the bumpers up at the bowling alley. When you have the bumpers up at the bowling alley, the, the journey through the middle might be a bit of a messy zigzag um, as you bounce around. But spotting this frame around the chapter is hopefully going to stop us falling into the exegetical gutter as we go. So yeah, we did this in our women's Bible study and we kind of, we got that clear um, right at the beginning um, and then we let the rest of it unfold. Um, and so we start with this, this um, recap, well recap for us, of the situation in Thessalonica. Um, and we see in verse 1 and 2 that Paul um, says, don't be alarmed by fake news. So just to remind us, here's the situation. Paul's had some intel that someone is operating this kind of phishing scam in his name and touting this dodgy teaching about the day of the Lord coming. How many, how many of you got this email from John Lewis this morning? Yeah, a few. Right, so you might have got an email. From John Lewis has the same problem, apparently, and they've emailed their customers to say, that we've heard that you might be getting some emails that appear to be from us um, and have all these, you know, excellent deals on them. But just so you know, that's not from us. That's not the real deal. And then here's all the way to, to spot a legit email. Exactly the same thing happening with Paul. Um, and 
uh, the, the news is about the day of the Lord coming. He says, don't, don't get alarmed by that. Um, and it's a, an important thing just to realise, isn't it, that Christians do get alarmed by day, end of the world stuff and day of the Lord stuff, don't they? Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of kind of um, nervy teaching or kind of movies made about um, things that are going to happen when the, the day of the Lord comes. In fact, I this was such a gift. Um, I was when I was prepping this, I tried to find a map of where Thessalonica is because I don't know where is this place. Um, so I did like a Google image search, clicked on this map, and then noticed that the website was called, I think it was called Conforming to Jesus or something like that. Conform, becoming like Jesus. Oh, sounds good. I um, wonder what this website is. It, and I clicked on it and it turned out it was like an end times website, um, which was unexpected. Um, but they were very, their approach to the end times um, was your job is to spot it. So you need to know the signs and you need to be prepared. Um, because when you see those signs, your job, Christian, is to survive. Like you've got to survive the end times. Um, and I was like clicking around. They literally had like a whole page with 37 different ways to get your energy off grid and the different types of generators you need and that kind of thing. A lot of alarm about the day of the Lord and what's going to happen. Um, it makes people nervy. But remember, Paul, just let's get this triply clear as we start. Paul doesn't want them to be shaken. And here's how I think the rest of the chapter plays out. I think he's going to give them enough information to spot that Jesus has not come back. Just stick with this for a moment because we're, it's a, it's, we just want to get clear in our head of what he's doing. We want to we get, get this yeah, straight before we go into the meat of it. Paul's, Paul's not trying to give them signs so that they can spot that the end of the world is coming or the day of the Lord is coming. But he is trying to give them signs to spot that it is not the day of the Lord. Yeah? And so this is one of those areas where people think that 1 and 2 Thessalonians actually contradict each other. Because in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. What's the point about a thief in the night? He doesn't tell you that he's coming. So in 1 Thessalonians, surprise, Jesus is coming. Then people are like, 2 Thessalonians, he gives them all these signs and that they're supposed to be looking out for it. Paul's theology has changed. Oh my goodness. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't changed. I think he's giving us signs to convince us that the day of the Lord has not happened. Okay? Well, right, let's get into that. In verses 3 to 11, Paul, Paul says, don't be confused by the times. He says, don't be confused by the times. Let's just take a pause because it's late in the evening and um, you don't just want to listen to me for a long time. Um, let's just turn in pairs. Again, this is something we did in our Bible study. It was very helpful. We're just going to do a bit of data gathering for this kind of tongue twizzler in verses 3 to, three to 12. Is it 3 to 12, yes. Um, so just turn to your neighbour, scan through verses 3 to 12, and just try and list all the different players or characters or beings or groups. Okay, anything that's like a person, um, just write it down. Don't stress if you're like, but is that the same as that person? Don't answer it. Just write a list. Okay, two minutes, go for it. If you've got to verse 12, maybe just give me a little nod. Don't, don't give me eye contact. Yeah, okay. Sort of there, sort of, don't, okay. Don't worry if you haven't got through it. Um, it's not a test. Um, I'm just going to tell you what I came up with, okay? I, I spotted, I went broad, okay? The rebellion, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the mystery of lawlessness, the one who restrains, the lawless one, the Lord Jesus, Satan, God, those who are perishing. Anyone want to chuck out any others? That I've... Do it as a he between the one who restrains. Oh, yeah, some mystery pronouns like, oh, what's going on? Yeah, some he's and like it's and, and stuff we're not sure about. It's quite a list, isn't it? Yeah. Just take your time with things like this and just, just spend some time gathering the data. Pick out what's going on 
um, before you run too quickly to try to understand it. Um, I find that just a very helpful kind of um, steadying the ship kind of moment. Um, and then for what it's worth, in women's Bible study, we just broke into groups and said, well, what do we learn about each? Um, and just, again, just started to fill in some of the gaps. What can we, what can we say? What do we, do, what do we not know? And we sat in the ambiguity quite a lot. Okay. In these verses, 3 to 12, I think we get three big reasons not to be alarmed or not to be confused by the times. And we're over the page now. The first big reason in verses three and four is that the day of the Lord definitely hasn't happened yet. Three and four, the day of the Lord definitely hasn't happened yet. Why? Because these two really bad things have to happen first, like the big reveal, kind of changing rooms moment. Um, the day of the Lord won't come until the rebellion happens and the man of lawlessness has been revealed in verse three. So first of all, the rebellion, probably some kind of big falling away, a big abandoning of faith by believers. Sometimes the word apostasy is used. And then second, the man of lawlessness has to be revealed. Okay, what do we know about the man of lawlessness? Let's just look at the things that Paul tells us in verse four. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God. So he's kind of against, uh, against gods, against religion. He bigs himself up. Um, second, he takes his seat in the temple of God. Um, now, I think here, temple, um, there's a good case to be made that it's talking about, Paul's talking about the church, um, and the church is the fulfillment of the temple imagery at that stage of history. Um, Greg Beale's helpful on that. Um, but just the language, you know, even, even if we're not sure, it's a picture of someone coming in and kind of, you know, um, sitting where he's not supposed to be, like taking his seat in, in an arena that he doesn't belong in. Um, and finally, he proclaims himself to be God. It's a big, monstrous opposition to God. It's hideous. Like it should have like the imperial march behind it. Like dun, 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 the man of lawlessness. Like it's bad. It's how you feel about Darth Vader when you're seven, but worse. <laughs> the language is all from Daniel. So that's really helpful to know. I've put a few verses. In fact, let's go to 1136. It's not that late. We've got energy. Um, let's find Daniel chapter 11. And I think it's really helpful to see that Paul hasn't just plucked this imagery out of nowhere. Like he's not, he's not just having a kind of Paul moment of coming up with something new. He's, he's, he's drawing on um, uh, the Old Testament. So 11, chapter 11 in Daniel, verse 36 and 37. Just listen to this, see if it rings any bells. The king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. You could look around that verse as well. That is quite a few verses that help us, but there's the big one. The point, here, yeah, the point here is it is this big, obvious, kind of hideous um, person who is opposed to God and exalts himself as God. And these two things have to happen before um, the day of the Lord. Now, here's the problem. Here's where we start to get in a pickle, because we can probably all think of some people who sort of fit the bill for the man of lawlessness. You know, put in the name of like whichever politician freaks you out most at the moment. And you could find some ways to tie them in to, to the man of lawlessness checklist. But they, the problem is they only sort of fit the bill. You know, it depends, which, depends which, which bit of the world you live in or which bit of history you live in. Um, 
And so this is where we need to remember that this, this information is not there for the Thessalonians to spot the signs that it's happening, but it's showing them how big the signs are so that they're convinced that it hasn't happened yet. This is how Paul is correcting that teaching. It definitely hasn't happened because when it happens, it's going to be absolutely obvious. So who is the man of lawlessness? This is what you're waiting for. We don't know. I think we don't know. And I think we don't know because he hasn't come yet. But when he comes, it's going to be obvious. You know, if we can't conclusively point and go, that is the man of lawlessness, it's probably not it. So number one, the day of the Lord definitely hasn't happened yet because these two big things have to happen first. And on your sheet, I wouldn't die on a hill for this diagram, but it's kind of where I got to it, teasing it all out. So man of lawlessness, the rebellion, then Jesus returns and the day of the Lord happens. That's on the right hand side of that little thing. In verses 5 to 12, um, Paul says, in the meantime, God is in control. In the meantime, God is in control. Um, There's not enough room on the handout at this point, just to warn you, if you're taking notes, so you're going to have to do something creative. If verses 3 and 4 have this really future focus, and that like that these things haven't happened yet, in the next section, Paul unpacks what is going on in the present. And the big point here is that we under, need to understand the times that we are in. The language changes to now. Have a look at verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness, Paul says, is already at work now. Something is happening in the Thessalonians' time. And in both 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, we get the language of now. Now is the time when something or someone is restraining lawlessness. It's a time of restraint. The mystery of lawlessness is being held back. It is at work. It's being held back. Okay, we, if we don't know who the man of lawlessness is, what about the mystery of lawlessness? It sounds like it's someone different. And so if the man of lawlessness comes at the end, this seems to be something different. What do we do with that? Well, this is one of those moments where I think we just need to think about the language that Paul uses and assume that it's deliberate. Um, and remember what Sachi said about Bible words having Bible meanings. Just think about this language that Paul is using. He's saying the mystery of lawlessness is kind of yet to be revealed. Does that ring any bells for you? Don't worry if it doesn't. Um, but it rings a few bells for me um, about mysteries in the Bible. Mysteries are a, it's a fun thing to look at in the New Testament. And mysteries in the Bible are always revealed. That's what you need to know about mysteries. The greatest mystery to be revealed is the Lord Jesus. So um, places like Colossians 1 say a mystery hidden, for, uh, talk about hid mystery hidden for ages and generations, but God chose to make known the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ever since that first promise to Eve that her offspring would crush the head of the serpent, God's people have waited for the revealing, for the mystery to be made known. And while they were waiting, there were types and patterns of the one to come. All sorts of mini serpent crushes. People who gave us a picture or a glimpse of the one to come, but were only ever that, only a glimpse. So when the mystery is finally revealed, when the Lord Jesus kind of steps onto the stage of history, and the history of redemption, it is obvious that he is the one. And pictures that were like grainy black and white um, become full technical color. And we have a name for that offspring of Eve, the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if Paul's use of the language of mystery here helps us understand that in the same way, there is a pattern of lawlessness. Just think, since the Garden of Eden, the pattern of lawlessness and godlessness has been at work in our world. First, in Adam and Eve. Because what did Adam and Eve do? Well, first, they broke the command that God gave them about the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. They transgressed. They were lawless. 
And then second, do you remember what the serpent says to Eve? He says, well, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. They are godless. They set themselves up as mini gods. So this pattern of lawless and godless behaviour is at work throughout history, from the beginning. And at various points in history, it finds kind of particular embodiments in leaders and kings who raise themselves up as a figure against God. And throughout history, there have been many men of lawlessness doing man of lawlessness type things, opposing God, exalting themselves, and um, being against God's people. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of the north in Daniel, Caligula, Nero, Napoleon, you can name more recent politicians, leaders. And so it seems like Paul is just describing all of human history. There's this mystery of lawlessness that's been at work. But why? Well, because he doesn't want them to be alarmed or thrown off course by things that could maybe sort of look like the day of the Lord and end timesy stuff. Remember, the point of this chapter is not to give us enough signs to spot the end of the world, like, oh, it's coming, fire up the generator, check the canned goods. No, it's giving us enough, um, enough signs to see that the end hasn't come, that the day of the Lord hasn't happened. And there are lots of things that are confusing um, and that, that, that could confuse us. So just have a look. Um, at the rest of the, the verses um, in 2 Thess, in chapter 2. Um, we get Satan's activity by false signs and wonders. Sounds pretty confusing, sounds like it could be quite compelling. Um, people are being deceived in verse 10, confused by things. There is a strong delusion in verse 11. It's confusing. Like there's genuinely stuff to be confused about. It's a confusing time. Like, you know when a student girl comes to you and says, oh, Rachel, can I talk to you? And you're like, what's his name? And she's like, I don't know what's going on. There's this boy and he's texting me and like, it seems like something's going on and he's like sending me memes and it's like sending me pictures of his houseplants and like, it's, I think something's going on. But on the other hand, it's not asked me out, so it doesn't seem like anything's going on. But like, there's something going on. It's just a really confusing time. It's confusing because he's being confusing. Like, it is confusing. And in really not at all the same way. The time we live in. But it is confusing. It is confusing. It's like stuff that happens that makes us go, is that, like, is that kind of the end? Like, is this it? Like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that person is in power. Like, is, should I be ready? And Paul says, don't get thrown off course. Don't get confused. And um, be sure about what I've taught you. Because in the midst of all that confusing time, we need to know, here's what you actually need to write down in that space. It's a time of restraint. It's a time of restraint. Is, the, is it a lawless free-for-all that's going on? No. Um, did you spot the restrainer comes up twice? Um, have a look in verse 7. You know, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. This is good news. Now, who is the restrainer? Okay, four options. Choose your own adventure. Um, it could be uh, the church and her witness, sort of restraining evil, so, so sort of doing good and holding evil back. It could be Paul and his preaching, uh, so I guess as the gospel goes out, it kind of restrains evil. Uh, some people think it's the state and the governing authorities. Oh yeah, someone just went, oh. Um, so kind of as they legislate, they're kind of helping hold evil back. I don't know what I think about those three. I'm leaning towards option four, which um, actually is helped um, by um, Sydney Tooth, who's at Oak Hill. And if you have a look at the Oak Hill, it's called the Deep Roots podcast, super helpful. Um, and if you listen to the one with Sydney on Two Thessalonians, you'll think, oh, that sounds very familiar. 
<laughs> it was very helpful. Um, she says it's, she thinks it's Michael, the archangel. Oh, yeah, left field. But the more I've thought about it, the more it makes sense. Um, partly, two reasons. One is it fits with Daniel. So we won't look, look it up, but you've got a couple of verses there from Daniel that talk about Michael and what he's doing in these kind of crazy times that Daniel talks about. We just, we just forget it's there because that's the bit of Daniel that nobody preaches on. Um, and so it fits with the Daniel stuff. And I think as well, it fits with the kind of supernatural vibe of what's going on in chapter two. Like it sort of makes sense that if you had Satan at work and God at work and the sort of things at work, that there would be maybe something um, like an archangel at work as well. So I like that at the moment. Um, but yeah, you, you can go and have a think. Greg Beale's quite, no, maybe John Stott. One of them has some things to say. So there's a time of restraint. There's someone holding stuff back. Good news. And it's also a time that God is in complete control of. So yes, there's a delusion, but did you see who sends it? It's quite a big topic, but just, um, it's what Paul says. He says, God sends a strong delusion. It's, it's within God's control. Like he is on the throne of this whole situation. And I wonder if in those last few verses, Paul is describing a time where actually God, within his control, um, deliberately sends things and makes things happen that kind of force the two camps to emerge. So he's sort of okay with this delusion happening because it shows that people don't believe the truth. Um, and, and it shows up who is holding on to the truth. Hard idea? Maybe a whole seminar, come and chat afterwards. But I think that's what he's saying. So don't be confused by the times because um, God is absolutely in control. Okay, if that was all too much, don't worry. Come back to the room. This is the moment to pay attention. Third reason not to be um, confused or thrown off. Um, the thing is, when it does happen, Jesus is going to smash it. Okay? In the end, there's one thing that Paul makes really, really clear in this passage. Jesus wins and he wins big. Have a look at verse eight. Paul says, the lawless one will be revealed. And then like the next thing that happens is the Lord Jesus, whom the Lord Jesus will kill by the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So in our women's Bible study, we did all that data gathering and we thought about the different figures. We worked out the man of lawlessness, probs wasn't Satan, something about restraints. It was about as conclusive as we got. So we were left with Jesus on the whiteboard. What do we learn about Jesus? And it turns out that what every women's Bible study needs, really needs for success, is a straight-talking northerner. And in our group, that's, that's our administrator, mayor, and she just went, well, clearly he's the most powerful person in this. He just walks into the room and breathes and it's all over. <laughs> we were like, yeah, mic drop, job done. That's the big point, right? She's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. Yes, the revealing of the lawless one has to happen before Jesus comes. Yes, it sounds hideous. But the next thing that will happen is is that Jesus will come and he will come in this almighty display of power. It will be a completely one-sided fight, not even a tussle. He just walks into the room and breathes and it's game over. That's how it's all gonna end, with Jesus. In one of the, um, uh, one of the gentlemen in my, oh, he's gonna be, oh, he's gonna hate that, I called him gentleman. Blokes, one of the guys in my growth group is, um, uh, a kind of big wig in science at Glasgow. He's basically in charge of science in the world, as far as I can work out. Like, goes to these conferences. He said he was at a meeting recently where they were talking about all the ways that the world is going to end, um, in sciencey ways. And then he came to a Bible study in Revelation last week, um, just in the early chapters. And we were like, oh, yeah. It's all about Jesus. Like the answer isn't the climate and the answer isn't whatever illness he's trying to solve. How's the world gonna end? Jesus, all of history is Jesus-centered. 
And when Jesus returns, it will bring this catastrophic and final end to wickedness. So, when we take a step back from all of that, what do we find? Lawlessness sounds out of control, but it's actually being restrained. People are being taken in by a delusion, but that is within God's control. And when the man of lawlessness does appear, he will be absolutely crushed by the breath of Jesus. Is this chapter starting to sound comforting? And that's where Paul ends it. So in those last few verses, 13 to 17, Paul says, stand firm and be comforted. Stand firm, hold to what you have been taught. Stick with what I told you in verse 15. What is it that makes the Thessalonians different? It's their belief in the truth in verse 14. And just compare that um, to what people are doing. In verse 12, people who did not believe the truth. Verse 11, people who believe what is false. The Thessalonians need to stick with the truth. See, what we believe really matters for salvation. As we're starting to see in this letter, what we believe really has an impact on our keeping going. And so Paul returns to the language of giving thanks, of having to give thanks, that obligation again. We ought to give thanks in verse 13. He just can't help it because their salvation is so secure. It's not the end and they are sticking with it. Again, Paul finishes this section with a prayer, as he does every chapter, for what he hopes and longs for these young Christians in light of all that he's taught them, a prayer of reassurance and comfort. So have a look at the second half of verse 16. It says, God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. And you get the petition, the request in verse 17. May he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This chapter of 2 Thessalonians, it's not like the planetarium to an eight-year-old. It's, it's a chapter of comfort and security. Yes, the world feels like a spiritual wild west. I mean, all the time. People do whatever they want. Yes, people believe some wild things at the moment. And it, and it leaves us looking at each other thinking, are they doing that? Are they making that piece of legislation? Did they just vote that person into power? Are they celebrating that person? Are they, are they putting that on the internet? Is the church doing that? I can't believe it. But friends, in the midst of all of that, God is on the throne. Things are not out of control. And one day Jesus is going to walk into the room and just breathe and it will be game over. So be comforted and keep going. Let's pray, shall we? Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Are we having a moment? I'm going to have a few minutes. So um, let's just take a few, few moments of quiet just to reflect on how the Lord has been comforting us. <laughs>